Well, hi everybody. Um, I kind of forgot that there was an intro bit, so we can skip most of this slide. Um, but the key point is that I like micro bits. So uh, that leads us straight to our first point, which is what is a micro bit? And the answer is this. It's very small, and you probably can't see it from back there, but people near the front, there are 10 of them down here. If you would like to come and grab them and pass them around, um, have a little look and see, see what they are, and so on. Um, dive in now um, and pass them around, have a, fun, have a play, press the buttons, have a look. Cool. So while that's happening, um, also what's on them will work best if all of them are gone. So I'm just going to, Bruce, find friends. <laughs> um, so while they're going out, um, Here's a quick little overview of what's on a micro bit. It's got a lot of stuff packed into a really small package. We've got a lot of LEDs on the front. We've got these two buttons. It's got a compass and an accelerometer. It's got Bluetooth and radio. Um, and it's got this edge connector for connecting all sorts of accessories, which I will come to later. But it means that there's a whole lot going on here. But what does this mean for teaching micro bits? Well, in broad strokes, it's a, there's an element of physicality to it. When you're teaching, say, uh, just normal Python, um, it's on the computer, it's probably in the command line to begin with, and it can feel really removed and super abstract. But with the micro bit, which runs micro Python, it's right here, you can see it. It has a, a while true loop. And I'll come to why there's a while true loop in almost every micro bit program later. But this makes it quite different to teach because you probably don't introduce while loops, and certainly not while true loops, for quite a while if you're teaching Python normally. Timing matters. When you're running a normal Python program, uh, it runs start to end, and the timing doesn't matter so much. Whatever you've put in happens in the order you've put it in. There might be loops, but you don't care too much about how fast they are until you're a bit along your journey. But timing really matters with a micro bit, and we'll come to why later. There are attachments. As I said with the edge connector, and as you can see as you're passing them around, there's a bunch of little gold-plated pins down the bottom. There's one that says 3V, which is the power supply, 3 volts. There's a GND for ground. That's where you connect that back up. And there's a bunch of data pins, and some of them are more special than others. There's the three real big ones. There's a lot of tiny ones. And lastly, it's got a radio. And this is actually a really big thing. The radio is great. So what does the physicality actually mean? So it's right there. You can see it. You can feel it. When the program doesn't work, you can see how it doesn't work a lot of the time. If you say, you know, if you're expecting it to show a smiley face and it shows a sad face, it's not just some text on a screen, it's lights on, on the micro bit. And that really works well for a lot of kids. Um, it means it's super fun. Because it's there and because you can pass it around and you know, have a look, it's really engaging. And the flip side to really engaging is that it is super distracting. Uh, kids will spend a lot of time playing with the micro bits. That's probably OK, in my opinion. I think the trade-offs are well worth it. Um, and I know that I've spent a lot of time distracted by the micro bits. <laughs> so because of this physicality, the students find it more real. It's a real world thing. And that can be a big jump for a lot of students. I know when I was first learning the program, a lot of the stuff that I learned, I was just like, OK, sure, I can see how to do maths in a programming language. But why do I care? When am I going to do maths? Or you know, I can. I can, you know, I can't put it together. I didn't see what I was trying to do. But with a micro bit, you're right there, and it's like, okay, well, I want this to happen when I press the button on the micro bit, and it connects a lot better. So this means that different, and hopefully more, students get engaged by the micro bit. Um, it can be hard to engage students. I certainly have come across this, but I find the micro bit's a really good way to get around this. And lastly, and this plays into the distraction though, they'll want to show their friends what they make. And I think this is a really good thing. It's great to be excited about something you've made. And it's great to make something and then hand it off to your friends. And then they go, oh, how did you make that? And you 
share with them and you teach each other and you build bigger and better things together. That's how learning works really well. So, that's how the physical elements are different. But, I mentioned this while true loop. Why do we need a while true loop? Well, let's look at a code example here. Here's a simple uh, microbit Python program. And all it does is when you press the A button, as long as you're holding it down, it shows a happy face on the micro bit. If you let go, it shows a sad face on the micro bit. It likes attention. So, why do we need the while true loop? Well, in a normal Python program, and most programs, things run top to bottom. That's true here. But the micro bit, by virtue of being a physical device, not something there's no run button to hit. There's no terminal where you, you hit enter or no interpreter where you go line by line. You connect the battery pack or you hit the reset button on the back and it just goes all done. For a physical device, that's not super good. It can work if you have lots of sleeps and it's doing one thing and there's no interactivity, but then we kind of, well, why are we using a physical device if there's no interactivity and you've just got to, you know, you're not making use of what you have. So, we have this while true loop so that this program will just keep going. And this is the format that you'll see for a lot of embedded systems programming. Um, it's, it's frequently referred to as the main loop. Um, and it's just where most of it's going to happen. But there are some drawbacks to it and some things to consider when teaching it. Firstly is that loops are scary. Um, I don't know how long all of you have been programming, but if you think back to when you learned, loops can be really tricky. And it, it's something that you would introduce a bit later, you know, a couple of weeks in, if you're teaching just Python in the interpreter. But with a micro bit, you really need to introduce it pretty much at the beginning, because otherwise there's not a lot that can be done with a micro bit. So you need to introduce something that's a bit more advanced really early. So, how fast are they as well? So a micro bit runs at 16 megahertz, and so this loop's actually gonna be happening really fast a lot of the time. I know it's nothing like any of the laptops that anybody's gonna have here, but to a human, 16 megahertz is really fast. I'm certainly not that fast at anything. <laughs> but the students don't understand that initially. And so you get questions like, what happens if I press A after the loop? They don't understand what the loop does, and they don't realize that there is no after the loop. So you've got to guide them through to that and help them realize that any code that isn't nested inside that loop is never gonna happen. I've also had the inverse. What happens if I press A before the loop? And they really don't realize initially that it gets to that while true and starts doing that instantaneously as far as a human can tell. From my perspective, there is no before the loop. So when the loop goes that fast, what does timing even mean? How do, we, how do we time things that are going too fast for us? Well, in MicroPython for the micro bit, we have two different ways to check what the state of a button is. We have is pressed and was pressed. So what's the difference between those? Is pressed checks at the very instant you call it if the button is held down. This is really good for things like that simple program before when you just want to show a happy face if the button's held down and something else if it's not. And you don't care about sort of, you know, that program didn't actually care about timing too much. Was pressed is more complicated and checks if the button has been held down since the last time the button was checked. Um, this is really complicated and once you get to this for teaching micro bits, it, teaching was pressed can be you know, a multi-class multi endeavor. It is a extremely complicated topic and is hard to get your head around the first time. So how do we see the difference? Well, here's a program that checks if button A is pressed and shows a happy face, but also checks if button B was pressed and shows a sad face. So what happens when I hold down button A? If I hold down button A and we go through this program, it's just like the happy face program that we saw before. It's checking if button A is pressed, it's showing the happy face for a, for a second, um, sleep counts in milliseconds, 
and then it clears it. So if you just hold down A, it'll show the happy face, wait for a second, clear it, and then as a human can see, as far as a human can see, instantly puts the happy face back up again, and you never see a difference. If you hold down button B though, button B is was pressed. It checks, has the button been pressed since the last time we called was pressed? If it's the first time, it checks since the start of the program. So, holding down button B, you'll see the sad face for a second, and it'll go away. I'm still holding down button B, but it's not a new hold, so it's not going to show us the sad face again. There are other possibilities as well. What happens if I press button A, and then while the happy face is showing, press button B? Well, button B only cares if it was pressed, and so then it will immediately show the sad face as soon as the happy face has gone away. The opposite, where we press button B and then pr press button A, button A is only checking if it is pressed, so it doesn't care if you could press it you know, 20 times in the one second that the sad face is showing, it only cares that you're holding it down after the sad face has gone away. So this is a quick overview of the difference between is pressed and was pressed. And there are loads more of you know, niche edge cases of you know, how do you do anding to was pressed and all that sort of complicated stuff um, that I don't have time to go into here. But if you are going to teach micro bit, knowing that there is a trap there is essential because you've got to learn how to handle that yourself. So next up we have Attachments. This is where microbits can get really fun. So this is just a few types of things that you can connect a microbit to. You can see a microbit in each of those photos. And you can see they're doing all sorts of different things. One's a little buggy, one's uh, what's called a seven segment display that's showing the numbers. There's an LED strip and there's a little sort of gamepad controller thing. Yes, you can have the gamepad control the buggy. <laughs> But there are all sorts of more things you can attach and you know, basically anything, any circuit you can build. So even if you can't buy an off-the-shelf component, with some electrical knowledge, you can build really complicated things and run them with a micro bit. So this gives us a lot of freedom. We can change what we're doing with our micro bit by attaching different things. It enables and encourages creativity because students can decide what they want to attach and how they want to attach things and how they want those things to interact. This is really good uh, for the students who have found that, like, this is really good for the students who want to push themselves and get a little further and see real, what they can really do with the system. And because it allows bigger projects to be put together simply. One of these ways to make a big, bigger project is radio. So, the micro bit has an inbuilt radio on it with a radio library that is really good and simple to use. This is great because communications are cool. One micro bit, neat, you can connect a few things to it. Multiple micro bits talking together, now things start to get interesting. But who actually understands networking? And who understood networking when they were 10 years old? <laughs> Um, it's really hard, and I don't understand it. Um, but microbit radio just works. Um, it's really easy to set up and get running. And I have a super quick example of that. So those microbits that have been floating around, hands up if you still got one. You don't need to bring it back just yet. Have you noticed that occasionally a letter's appearing on the screen? Yeah, okay, a few nods, cool. So. Those 10 microbits that went out are actually five pairs of microbits. Um, I've written this program here. I wrote this last night. It did not take long. This is the extent of the program. Um, and what this does is we turn on the radio, we choose our channel and a letter, and we configure the radio to join that channel. Then, in our while true loop, if either button was pressed, we send our letter. On the other micro bit, oh, and then afterwards, because it's all part of the same loop, it's the same program running on each pair, or each micro bit of the pair, um, we receive 
So the radio.receive just checks if there's a message waiting for it. And if there isn't, it just sets it to none. Otherwise, it gets whatever message was sent. So here, we check if there is, we have received a letter that matches our correct one. I did that just in case anybody else has a micro bit that's on the same channel sending random letters. I didn't think it was likely, but I thought, let's do some proofing. <laughs> um, then we're going to show our letter, wait half a second, and then clear the display. And then we can do it again. So if we have a look, um, who, who has managed to find their partner? Has anybody found two microbits that are matched? Yeah, we've got a pair over here. Cool. Uh, does anybody else want to um, gather them, like find their pairs and bring the microbits back? Brackets, that's, I need those microbits. They don't, I, don't, I don't own them, and I would like them to come back, please. <laughs> I own one of them. <laughs> I own an E, so that's the one I really care about. <laughs> cool. So, um, in summary, microbits are great. Would highly recommend. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. And uh, I figured there's probably going to be a lot of questions, so let's leave a lot of time for questions, because they're weird, and I think a lot of people haven't come across them too much. Actually, that's a good question from me to you. Raise your hand if you've used a micro bit before. Oh, that's a lot of you. Cool. Raise your hand if you've used the radio on the micro bit before. Actually, that's a harder thing to parse. Put your hand up if you've used a micro bit but haven't used the radio before. <laughs> OK, cool. A few of you. Cool. Well, are there any questions? Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, just wondering how susceptible they are to electrostatic discharge. Um, so I keep these, I'm keeping all these in an antistatic bag. Um, to be frank, I don't know. Um, there's, uh, there's a man over there in a red shirt who might know. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Yes, so um, I teach at a summer school called the National Computer Science School. We use several hundred of them in a year, and we have for the past three, four years, and we've not destroyed a single one, despite them being handled and used by hordes of teenagers. One button fell off once. <laughs> one button fell off once. Uh, so I think that's pretty good on the durability rating. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, do the Um, so, happening underneath that, uh, there are interrupts. Um, he said, raising his eyebrow at the person who works at the Microbit Foundation. <laughs> no interrupts? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's what I thought. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yes, so. There are no interrupts uh, below. Uh, there are interrupts behind the scenes, but the Python code doesn't work on interrupts. It's all done with things like the was pressed, which uh, checks the state of variables set by those interrupts. Cool. Hi, could you share maybe something that students invented on their own? Yeah, for sure. We've had lots of interesting projects at the summer school that students have invented. Um, some of the best ones have been microbit versions of other of pre-existing games. So we've had students do straight up dance dance revolution. They've made big buttons on the floor, they've connected microbits, and then you know they do the whole dancing thing on these big buttons that they've made. We've had them make boppets. We had one year a bunch of kids make uh, basically a laser skirmish game. Um, I don't fully know where they got the laser, but they had one. <laughs> um, okay, well, it's his fault. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so all sorts of creative ideas. Um, and, uh, and a lot using the buggies as well. You've had, we've had kids do something like attach the micro bit to a participant check the accelerometer to see if they're doing like a push-up, and then the buggy does a race, and it's a competition to see who can do 
the most push-ups the fastest? Yeah, it's, uh, what Amanda said there is it's basically based on torture. <laughs> Hi, uh, two questions. One, how young can be a student to, in your experience, to learn with microbit? How what, sorry? How young can it be? Oh, how young? Um, it depends. Microbits are super expansible. So if you're just doing stuff with the buttons on the microbit, then I would say as young as you're comfortable teaching Python. So I would, I would say probably you know, 12, early teens, that sort of range. If you're doing stuff with the buggies and more complicated things and attachments and building circuits, you're starting to look at mid to late teens then, but you'll always have the outlying students who can do better and are more driven um, purely because they want to spend the time. Yeah, and just follow up question. Yeah. Um, do, do they need previous programming experience with something like a Scratch or something like that? Or they can directly jump into MicroPython? I think, I believe you can jump into MicroPython. Um, I believe Python's a really good programming language to learn with, even if you've never done anything like Scratch before. Um, if you go to the Grok Learning blog, I have a blog post about why Python's good to teach. Um, and yeah, so I, I think they can really just dive in. Oh yeah, also on the Grok Learning website, we do have a microbit playground that uses Blockly, which is a lot like Scratch. Um, and so we can program, you can program microbits using Blockly. And not only that, but the Grok Learning website has a download button where you can put it onto a real microbit instead of the simulated ones in the Grok Learning website. Um, and that's easy enough to use that that's how I programmed all of these. I didn't use a more real editor. Yeah, and, it, and it's worth mentioning as well that the um, Microbit Foundation also has a block-based environment too. So there yes. are block options if you want to work with really young students, um, as well as the, the MicroPython option. But as far as coding with a text-based language goes, MicroPython is by far the easiest entry point. Um, and then over there. Uh, it seems I am more interesting in Microbit than my son. Uh, is it open source? Can we hack into it? Uh, it is open source, yes, and you can contribute. Um, I, uh, the Microbit Foundation's website probably guides you to how to contribute. I can't say I have contributed, but you can. So this radio thing seems like it's really hard. Why don't I just use the Bluetooth? <laughs> cool. So. Um, Quick poll, raise your hand if you've ever written a program to do Bluetooth stuff. Cool, keep your hand up if you enjoyed that experience. <laughs> okay, you're an anomaly. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, uh, the short answer is this is a whole radio program. Um, Radio.on. You don't need to config. They all default to the same channel. So if you're just doing something yourself and not in a classroom, you don't even need that line. And then it's radio.send and radio.receive. That's all there is to doing radio in Python. It's pre-configured. It connects super easily. Um, there's something like 80, I want to say 88 channels, maybe 86, I don't know. 80-something um, channels. So lots of, you know, you have to have a real big classroom before you're getting into trouble there. And yeah, I think the radio is just a much better solution than Bluetooth because it's easier. Takes less code space. Takes less code space, which is important on a small device. More than pairs. <laughs> yes. In your sample there, you're, it looks like you're only sending one character worth of data over the radio. How much can you actually send? Um, you can send 253 bytes. Uh, it's 256 plus some stuff at the beginning, well, and there's some stuff at the beginning, so 253 bytes. So quite a lot, and I believe that's actually configurable and you can choose a longer size as well, but I haven't tried that. I've never sent more than 250 bytes. <laughs> I, uh, a quick question. Um, what is the gender balance amongst your student, and do you need to do anything to maintain interest of uh, as a gender? So, um, at the National Computer Science School, uh, particularly in summer camp, we work really hard to have a good gender balance. 
um, in part because it's an invite-only camp, and so it's easy to do that. We look through how many applicants we have and sort that out. Um, I find that microbits actually sort of, in a way, balance that a lot. Um, because you can come at it with that creative aspect that typically um, young women have been more encouraged to pursue, you can take that path in as opposed to taking the strictly logical path that young boys are more typically encouraged to pursue. And from there, you can get everybody into tech and uplift everybody. Um, and I haven't found as much difficulty as uh, keeping girls involved and engaged as I have with teaching straight Python. Uh, can you program in any other languages other than MicroPython and MicroBit? Yes, you can program them in uh, JavaScript, I know for sure. And if you go to Microsoft's Make Code, that's the language that they offer apart from blocks. Um, and uh, I suspect probably C. I know that, I mean, yep, C, cool. You can program them in C. Um, and maybe others. I'm sure that people have clutched all sorts of things onto MicroBits, but. Uh, definitely other languages other than MicroPython are available, yes. And, and it's worth pointing out that the most recent update to the MicroBit website now encourages Python as the go-to text-based language, um, which is really cool. So, yeah. And MicroPython specifically. Yes. I just wondered where you can buy them and how much they cost. Um, great question. Um, they are quite cheap. They're about 35 Australian dollars for a, a microbit. Um, and you can buy them uh, off the Kitronics website. You can buy them off Little Bird Electronics. Um, JCAR, even, yeah, even just popping into JCAR, you can get them. Um, uh, element 14, Coral. There, there are, there are yep. a number of providers. Anyone who's providing electronics to schools is basically stocking these now. And the more you buy, the cheaper you get them. So yes. you can get them down at about 20 if you're willing to buy 1,000. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think of the savings. So if I was a year seven kid who just got my micro bit, why should I be excited about this class and involved in it? Because of the possibility, um, I think you should be excited because of the possibilities you have. Um, I think a really great thing to do with a micro bit is to spend a bunch of time teaching and giving them tools and um, attachments that they can use and learn and so on, and then giving them a sort of more free form project and being like, well, make a project probably themed around a topic that the teacher has decided so that it, you know, and probably get the project approved with the teacher first. But make a project and, and let the student guide themselves. I think that works really well because then it's not, oh, yeah, we got more homework and we have to do, I don't know why this kid's voice is deeper than mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we, we got more homework and we have to do that. It's, hey, I'm inventing a thing. I know when I was a kid, I wanted to be an inventor. I think that's a really strong drive. I think everybody wants to create something. And if you're given the opportunities and the support and the equipment, I think just the freedom of creating something that you have decided upon is super exciting. Cool. Thank you. Okay, that's